So I want to talk about uh, joint work with Chen Meiri that continued the, the work Alex talked about last week. And, and this is going to be, I'm going to say this is going to be specialized to, 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 to arithmetic groups. Uh, but if you like these kind of things and you want to, to see this kind of rigidity phenomenon in, in more general, in other settings, then you should also look, there are other people that did similar work. Uh, maybe first among them is Andre Nice, uh, that I think was the first to consider this type of questions in the context of groups. Can um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, there, there are also, again, similar works uh, in the context of different groups than what we're going to talk about by uh, Katrin Tent and Dan Siegel, and also uh, those uh, more general work, again, the kind of frigidity that we're talking about, but in a, in a much more general setting of rings and, or, or other algebraic structures by uh, Lampovich. Um, Yasnikov and so on. Uh, so, yeah, check it out also. So, let me start by recalling Alex, the, the theorem that Alex said. The, the, the main theorem is that if gamma is a non-uniform lattice in a high rank semi-simple group. Okay, the high rank is essential here. That, that, that's really a high rank phenomenon. Then gamma is first order rigid. In the sense that if, that, that, that if you have another finitely generated group, this is again important, and uh, if delta is a finitely generated group and gamma and delta satisfy the same first order statements, then they're actually isomorphic. Okay, so I'll say that gamma is characterized or determined by, its, by the collection of all first order statements that it satisfies. So Ken and I, uh, after doing this work, sat down and, and asked and, and, you know, thought about questions that we would like to, to see solved. And we came up with certain questions and I want to talk about partial answers to these questions. So, um, so the first question is, the, the first natural question is what about uniform lattices? The second was an extension in different direction. Can you characterize your, your group, your lattice, uh, not by the collection of all of its first order statement, by, but, but, but rather by a uh, by single statement? Okay. This, this condition was, I think, studied first, well, not, in the context of groups, to study this first by, by Nice, as I mentioned. And uh, Nice called this property quasi finitely axiomatizable. The quasi is because it's, um, it's not among all groups, but rather among all finitely generated groups. Okay. And this is an example, th this is again a, a rigidity property of the group. It means that. It's an isolated point in the space of all finitely generated groups. The space of all groups, or subspace, the space of all finitely generated groups, has a topology, okay, given by, you know, an open set would be all groups that satisfy a first order property. Okay, so all commutative groups 
is a is an open set and uh, property two so being characterized by a single statement means that your group is isolated doesn't have the formations in the space the next question is whether or not you can characterize families of groups. By first order logic. Okay, so maybe maybe the 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 the, the, the holy grail in is is the following question: Can you is being a high rank? higher rank lattice actually a first order property. Can you write down a formula that says, I am a higher rank group, okay? It, it doesn't look like one. It doesn't look like that it, it, it's true, right? The way we define, first, the way we define lattices uh, is not first order, but maybe there is a first order formula that, that, or, or sentence that's equivalent. And finally, a question that uh, the truth is we didn't write down immediately after doing this. It took us half a year to figure out that that's a good question is what are the definable subgroups? Of gap. So a definable subgroup, so a definable set more generally is a set that you can define using first order property. So, so, so you take a formula and, it, and this formula might have constants in gamma and you're looking for all X that satisfy phi of X. Okay. This is called definable uh, sub uh, a subset and we're asking about the definable subgroups. Okay, so here are... Yes, there, could, could you clarify? I mean, if you take your constants to be elements of a given subgroup, then uh, that can be a trivial answer. So maybe there's some other assumption. No, my constant can be in the group. Uh, but so, so why is not every subgroup definable? It's definable by. Because you need to use only finitely many. Finitely many, okay. Because your sentence, first order sentences are finite, they use finitely many symbols. Okay. So, so for example, as you said, every finite subgroup is defined. Okay, and, and and let's say the centralizer of seven elements is is definable, but it's not even clear that 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 congruence subgroups are defined. Did, did I answer the question? Yeah, I guess definable subgroups are classified by or defined by finitely many statements. That's the right. Uh, well, if if it's if they are defined by finitely many statements, then then they are defined by one, right? You can just state the conjunction. Okay. Yeah. So so it's important they are defined by a single statement. Okay. So so I want to give partial answers to to this. The first one answers the uh, the first two questions. Okay, so if gamma is either a, a lattice from the previous lecture or a lattice of orthogonal type, the simplest kind, uh, which might be co-compact, and, and just, you know, the, the, there's this technical issue that we need the degree to be greater than or equal to nine, and a non-technical issue that we want the center to, to be trivial, Okay, I, maybe I'll have time to talk about this condition. Uh, then gamma is characterized by single first order statement. Okay, there is a single first order statement that says I am this and that group. As for the, the second question, which is to characterize families of groups, our result is that there is a first order statement such that the finitely generated gamma satisfies phi if and only if. Oh, so I, I, I forgot to say in the first statement, of course, characterized has to be within the collection of finitely generated groups. Okay. So the second statement that if a finitely generated group satisfies your, your statement, then 
גמא is isomorphic to PSLN of OS where n is some number, some integer greater than or equal to three and OS is the ring of S integers. In any unspecified uh, number field. Okay, and S should be finite, let's say. Okay, so this, this is a big chunk of. Sorry, I'm a bit perplexed there that if n is two and OS has got infinitely many units, uh, yeah. Uh, they're, they're sort of that's wrong, probably. You've got infinitely if there, yeah. Say that again. It's just your statements if, so you have a, yeah, so how do you distinguish that case which has a congruent, has a bounded generation congruent subgroup property? Well, you probably can uh, talk about by say, saying that if two elements generate, you can say if two elements generate uh, an important class two group, then they commute or something like that. So, Wait, how do I distinguish between n equals yeah, two and n equals three? I can. I can. There's no problem. There might be, there might be a statement here. that says, you know, probably- the, How does P you know, pick it up? You said there's a, a fee which you'll give us maybe. Yes, probably yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> But how does fee distinguish? That's all I'm asking. Where in fee does it distinguish it? Okay. Uh, Would you say if- I, 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 I will answer this question. Uh, maybe I'll say something that, that that's a very specific instance of, of what the theorem that we proved. What you can, what we actually prove that every recursive, every reasonable collection within this set. So you can take PSLN where N is a product of seven primes of OS where O is the ring of number uh, of is the, is the integers in a, a quintic extension of Q. This is also characterized by a single first order statement. Okay, so distinguishing between n equals two and n equals three that is not a problem. Okay, I'll wait for uh, you. I, 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 Just in my box. I prefer to answer, I prefer to answer this question after I'll okay. say okay. more or less why it's true, okay? I guess it does get PSL, right? Okay, so there's some. Uh, So both in, in this theorem and in the last theorem, uh, so, so theorem two, we can extend it. It's not about PSLN, okay? Uh, we can extend it also to orthogonal groups and probably though we didn't do it uh, to, to other groups, to, uh, to other uh, families. Uh, but we can't do it for all families. We can't do it for all higher rank lattices. The real problem, the, the thing we really don't know how to do is, uh, is units in division algebras. So, so, so here this gamma is not a, a, a are, are you working with subgroups of a, of a fixed thing or I guess not? No, 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 gamma is, is an arbitrary finitely generated group. I will explain what, 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 what stands behind this theorem. Uh, and again, under the condition of theorem one, so you fix your lattice, it may be non-uniform, higher rank lattice, it may be non-uniform, and it may be uh, a, a lattice of orthogonal type. Uh, any, say, finitely generated, subgroup of gamma is defined. Okay, and again, this is, um, that's really a, 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 a very weak 
consequence of what we actually proved. What we proved is that every recursively enumerable set, subset of gamma, is defined. So, um, okay, so I, so I want to talk about the ideas in the proof, what, 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 what's the general picture here? And there are two, um, two ingredients that come into the play. So one logical and the other maybe, you know, book theoretic. Is there any relation between this and the uh, decidability questions of smooth yes. projective varieties of a Q? In so this, I mean, Z, not directly, but but yeah, I mean, yes, they're very similar to. Right, so, but so you see that the same thing proves both this uh, theorem three, yeah. that every finitely generated subgroup is definable, and the fact that the theory of of the of, of, of the lattice is undecidable. Okay. So the first idea, which which will I think answer Peter's question, is is a notion from logic called interpretability or by interpretability. Interpretability is 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 the notion that in computer science we would call uh, emulation or compilation. Okay, and that's the that's the idea that you know one computer can run programs that were originally written for another computer, okay? So there is a way to take code written for, um, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Apple processors and, and transfer it to, to code that, that can run on Intel processors. And in the same way, you can sometimes, if you have two structures, to, to mathematical objects, you can emulate one inside the other. Okay, so let me give you the definition. Okay, and I'll give you this in the case of inter uh, interpreting a ring, let's say the ring of integers, inside the group, gamma. So an interpretation of the ring of integers in gamma consists of three things. First of all, a definable set that I'll call I of Z. And that's a definable set in gamma. And when I say definable set in gamma, it, it, it's, it's actually a definable set in some power of gamma. Okay, and again, definable for me means with parameters in gamma. And then two definable functions that I'll denote I of plus and I of times, and these are defined, and these are binary operations on I of Z. Or oh, I should mention maybe uh, a definable function is a function whose graph is a definable set. Okay. Uh, and this is my emulation of Z, okay? So I need an, uh, an isomorphism between Z plus and times and, and, and the following, and, and the set I of Z together with the interpretation of addition and the interpretation of multiplication inside, okay? Um, let me give you an example. Of can, you, can you say what isomorphism means here? An isomorphism. Meaning of like a, a, of a ring here or something or? Yes, so, so this is a ring. So it, it's an interpretate, so it's an isomorphism of sets with binary okay. functions on them. So, so you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a function from, it's a set theoretical function from Z to I of Z such that, that, that commutes with 
that, that intertwines the, the usual addition with what I call I of flux, it intertwines the usual multiplication with what I call I of times, okay? Which means that uh, this set with two binary operation, uh, with two binary opera operations is a ring, and it's actually a ring isomorphic to Z. Okay, thank you. So let me give you an example of how do you do such a thing. Okay, let's take S of 3Z, and let's take as my set, the, the, the thing that will emulate the ring C to be the center of the centralizer of the root matrix E13. Okay? So, so, so the set is actually the collection, is, is actually the root subgroup. Collection of all matrices of this form. Okay. Yeah. And now, so, so it's clearly as, uh, in bijection with Z, and I want to construct the operations. Now, the addition is easy, right? If I take two root elements, I can just take their product, and this will correspond to addition. Okay, multiplication is only slightly more complicated and you do it in two steps. First of all, you take your two elements and you conjugate them by, fix, by fixed elements, okay, by fixed permutation matrices <clears throat> to be different root elements. And then you can take their commutator. And this would give you the matrix uh, whose the, the root uh, matrix whose, whose, that corresponds to x times y. Okay, so you can find a, a anyway, so you can emulate uh, you know, both addition and multiplication inside them. Now, so, so here's a diagram of what's happening. So on the left, I have uh, all definable sets of gamma. Okay, and again, definable set, I mean, not just inside gamma, but it can also be in some Cartesian power of gamma. Okay. And, uh, and I can emulate, so, uh, okay, so on the left I have the, the collection of all definable subsets of gamma. And on the right, I have all definable subsets of Z or of Z to some power. Okay. And I have an interpretation. I can interpret Z inside of gamma. And clearly I can interpret gamma inside of Z, right? Gamma is, is just given as a, as a collection of nine tuples. It's a definable collection of nine tuples of elements of Z. Okay, so inside Z, I have, you know, part of this world of definable subsets in, uh, in Z behaves as if it was the definable subsets in gamma. And similarly, inside gamma, I have part of this world is are the definable subsets that behaves like the definable subsets in Z. But of course, I can look at those subsets in Z that, co that correspond to subsets in gamma. So I have right, the following picture. Okay, and I have uh, a part of gamma actually interprets itself. So I have an interpretation of gamma inside itself. Okay, so I have an isomorphism between gamma and uh, the interpretation of the interpretation of gamma. Can you say again a little more about why you um, Sorry, gamma is definable in, in Z? Is that what you said? Yes. Uh, why gamma is definable in Z? Yes. Because gamma, right? Gamma is S of 3Z, right? It's the collection oh, okay. of all x1, x11, one, one, oh, x33 okay. that satisfies some polynomial. Okay. Right. Now, 
what, what they should have said that once you, if you can emulate addition and multiplication, you can now emulate uh, every definable set, right? Because you just replace every, for every X in, in Z by for every X in my definable set that looks like Z. And you can replace the conditions like, you know, uh, X squared is, is one or something by the corresponding condition on the elements in the ring that emulates it. Uh, you could say that now gamma is as complex. I mean, you could use Matusevich, for example, to make undecidable statements in gamma just from this. Yeah, no, I, that, that was that was my next thing. <laughs> that that was well, yeah. not my next thing, but but you know, I was going to say this. In, in, in I assume you have no interpretation of Q, <laughs> which is the big unsolved well, problem there. Yeah. Well, in terms of any, is I mean, where they start to prove undecidability of, say, smooth projective varieties over Q, mm -hmm. is that Z is definable, but Q is, in, uh, there are some conjectures of, I think, Poonen, and maybe Mesa, which do give you that. So my question is, do you have a non-commutative group theory? And they do use quaternions. I think Julia Robinson was already using quaternion analysis. So I'm just wondering if you have a new view on that. That's a big unsolved problem there. You so know what's, what's the precise problem? Is is that our diaphantine equations of a Q undecidable or not? Uh -huh. Of a Z they're undecidable. And Mazer stuck his neck out just for fun to say that it's different over Q. I mm -hmm. uh, say so just for fun because uh, I'm not sure he believes it himself. But. <laughs> right. One of the things that you're talking about, one of the differences is that you're talking about. Uh, unsolvability of equations, and I'm talking about unsolvability of definable sets of, of, of uh, uh, yeah, okay, finding out if a definable set is, is empty or not. Yeah, but my memory is that if you could, so one of the key things in that work is to show that Z is definable in some structure. We, we, are, we are getting there. Okay, all right, all right. We're, we're getting there, yes. Um, but anyway, Z is definable. This, this is what I just showed you. Z is definable, interpretable in SL3Z. Okay. Um, where was I? So, so again, what, what you get is something interesting. You get a, an interpretation of gamma inside itself, and not just an interpretation, you get an isomorphism. But this isomorphism is set theoretic. Okay. And it's not clear that this isomorphism, and, and usually it's not true, that this isomorphism is definable itself. Th this, is a mean, this is a meaningful question, okay? Because in, on both sides, there are elements in the same, in the same category, in the same uh, world, okay? This is a subset of gamma to the something, actually 81 in this. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, so this is non-trivial condition. This is what constitutes uh, what's called the bi-interpretation. Okay, so bi-interpretation of gamma and, and, and the ring Z is a mutual interpretation. So an interpretation of gamma in Z, an interpretation of Z in gamma, such that the two isomorphisms gamma uh, isomorphic to the interpretation of its interpretation in Z isomorphic to the interpretation of its interpretation. These two so are definable. <laughs> Uh, okay, so again, an in, a, a interpretation and, and another by interpretation give you a way to transfer information from, uh, from let's say, the ring Z to, to gamma. So for example, uh, you know, Gedel's work about the unsolvability of Z, you can pull it back and get unsolvability of gamma. 
the fact that, again, Gettel's work that every recursively enumerable su subset, every recursively enumerable set in Z is actually definable, you can pull it back to gamma now, I mean, after you <laughs> improve by interpretation, and get that every recursively enumerable subset in gamma is definable. But of course, every finitely generated subgroup is recursively enumerable. Neil, could you give an example of I1? Like, how do, like, so just for intuition, how do you interpret gamma inside Z? Like, you gave an yes. example. Yes. Um, here. So let me write it. So S, gamma is S of 3Z, right? Okay, so it's the collection of all nine tuples, x11 up to x33, that satisfy some polynomial, right? Meaning that the determinant of this matrix Okay. One. <laughs> Sorry. Is that of you one? Is this okay? Uh, <laughs> zero. Oh, why is it zero? One. Sorry. Um, okay. But take the statement on nine variables that I'll call them x11 up to x33. Okay. Take this to be this condition. This is a polynomial. So it's a polynomial condition, therefore, polynomial f of x, f of x11 up to x33 is equal to zero. This is a first order statement. It gives you a, a set. Okay. Now you need also to define a binary operation on this set. Okay, this that's called the set given by this x v. That's a definable subset of z to the nine. Okay. Now you need to define a binary operation that will correspond to the group operation. Okay, but, the, but again, the group operation multiplication of matrices is given by nine polynomials, which you can just write down. Okay. Did, did I answer the question? Is I do I do people from home or you know, from distance can also ask a question and maybe even try to ask a question if, yes, even if you don't because they want to check the system. Yeah, so we, we invert one question, at least one question. Uh, can we pick on someone? <laughs> In the next, uh, give, give them time, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah somebody can. Okay, yeah, the ask. fact that, Neil, the fact that we can actually simulate matrix multiplications in using computers, doesn't that imply this inter interpretability property? Uh, in a sense? Yes, uh, but there's a simple, yeah, yes, but there's a simpler way to interpret this. You just, uh, SLN is just given as a definable set. It's given by a vanishing of polynomials, right? But if vanishing of polynomial is an example of a first order condition, right? So, uh, and, and the binary operation, the, the matrix multiplication is also given by uh, polynomials, right? And mm -hmm. again, polynomial maps are definable just because you can, the, the, the condition that y is equal to x squared is a definable condition, is a first order statement. Okay, so 
So again, there's a way to transfer information. And for us, what's important and not trivial. So there are a few things that you can now do trivially. You can just, once you have interpretation in both ways. Actually, can I ask a question? Sorry. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so you define interpretability with respect to the ring operations, right? Um, yes. Plus a multiplication, but then the example that you gave for gamma is more of a group interpretability. So, so, so there are two things here. Uh, the first is I can, I want to interpret the ring inside the group. Okay, so I, so I am allowed to only use the group operations, but now I want to interpret both addition and multiplication. Okay, and then you interpret the group inside. Right, and now I want to as a, as a ring? Inside the ring, yes. Okay, and then the bi-interpretability from gamma to gamma is, is, is a bi-interpretability of groups, of rings. Does, does that question oh, even okay. make sense? Yeah, oh, I see, I see, I see. I see. This, this, is a definable set in gamma. Actually, again, as I said, gamma to the 81, okay? It's given by some subset of 81 tuples of gamma. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, not gamma to the 81, ga gamma to the, sorry, this is gamma to the nine. So uh, it's given by some collection of, definable collection of nine elements together with some cr crazy definable map, binary operation, okay? And this happens in, you know, in the world of gamma. So, so it's in the theory of gamma as, in, as a group. It, 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 the theory is not so important. It, it's inside the, it, it's inside the language of, of Yes, gamma. thank you. Okay. Uh, but this isomorphism, I want to stress, this isomorphism is a priori set theoretical. And to put the condition that it's actually definable is, is a strong condition. Here, could you suggest um, why it's strong? It's a bit hard for me to imagine. Yes, I, 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 want to, I, I want to continue this example and, say, and, and tell you what actually needs to be proved. Okay, I, I will do this in, in two minutes. Okay, but before that, I want to tell you why we're so interested, and that's a wonderful theorem of Khalif uh, that says that if gamma is finitely generated and bi-interpretable with the integers, then gamma is characterized by single first-order statement, of course, among finitely generated groups. Okay, so it can be axiomatized. Okay, and uh, this really, the, the, the starting point of this Theorem is, is the fact that Z itself, the integers can be characterized among all finitely generated rings using a single first order statement, okay? And then you need to show how this pulls back to gamma using this by interpretation. Okay, so I think the most confusing thing is uh, what needs to be shown, okay? So let me go back to this example. Okay. So I interpret Z as certain type of three by three matrices, right? These are uh, root, root elements. And I interpret gamma as three by three matrices whose entries are those root subgroups. Okay, so what, what, what appears in the, the right-hand side is a three by three matrix whose elements are themselves three by three matrices, but not every three by three matrices uh, comes only root matrices. So if you follow back the, this example, if you write it down, this map is, a, is the following map. So this matrix A, B, C up to I, goes to the following matrix. That's 81. <laughs> That's the 81, yes. <laughs> okay, etc. 
you see the matrix. Okay? So that's a map from gamma to gamma to the nine. And you want to show that this map is definable. Okay? So let me do something. Uh, let's look at the part of this map, okay? The map that takes me a matrix, a three by three matrix with determinant one, and outputs this matrix, the root matrix, whose uh, one three uh, 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 entry is the one one entry of my original matrix. This Could is what we, we need. Sorry, sorry, let me ask a question, yeah, because I think the theme of the, of the four, first four lectures. Should we be concentrating or focusing on your use of unipotent matrices in this heavy way? Um, so it, it, it's easiest to explain things when they are unipotent. It makes life very easy. I want to spend, uh, you know. So I mean, these maps that are very much dependent to get all the structure from the non, you know, uh, are very much based on formulae with upper triangular, for example. You're right, you're right. Uh, uh, so when, when you get to your result where in a compact quotient, you're going to show us how, what you do, right? Right, but uh, I want to explain in, a, in an easier setting what is, first, what okay. is the question, rather than why. Oh, right, right, I just, uh, so I shouldn't worry about the fact that everything's unipotent here as being very important. No, 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 I, I, I will get, to well the to how do you overcome the unipotence? Okay, but I want to explain it because I want to explain why this map is definable because we do a variant on this argument. Okay, I, I'm going to use bounded generation in a minute, and I want to explain what we use in the in the uniform case. How do okay. we bypass this bounded Fair generation? Enough. Okay, thanks. So, so really, the question is. Why is this map, the map that takes uh, this matrix and outputs the matrix whose, the, the root matrix whose uh, one three element is the one one element of the original matrix? Why is this a definable set? Why, why is this definable? Okay, in, in this case, I'm going to use bounded generation. Okay, and, and later on, I'll show you how we bypass this using a weaker form of bounded generation. Okay, so, uh, so bounded generation tells me that my group SO3Z is a product of sets. Okay, it's the all powers of E12, and then all powers of E13, and so on. You know, 12 of them suffice. Uh, and the same is true for, for my interpretation of gamma inside itself. Okay, so again, these are matrices whose entries are inside our root elements. Okay, and this is also a, a, a boundedly generated. So let me write down. So this. is the product of this subgroup and then this subgroup, so this is E13, B, and so on. Okay. Now I have the map from above, okay? The map that sends these matrices this matrix to, to, to this big, you know, nine by nine matrix. Okay, and I want to show it's definable. I don't know this, but I do know that this map that sends E12 to this matrix is defined. Why? Because I can take E12 and conjugate it, E12 to the power of A and conjugate it to get the matrix E13 to the power of A, and then put it as the one two entry of my, uh, of my matrix, okay? So now that this is definable map, and this is definable map, 
and so on. And therefore the map, and, and, and if I have, you know, and therefore if I take a product of 12 elements uh, from above and take it to the product of 12 elements below, this will be a definable map. Okay? But this covers all the group already. Okay, are there any questions about? You don't have to check that anything's well-defined here? You don't obvious? because it is well-defined. What you show, what you show is the following. Suppose you have an element here and an element here, and you ask yourself that you want to express in a first order language, the fact that X goes to Y, right? So what you say is there exists an A or, or an element here, there exists an element here, et cetera. There exists an element here, such that the product of these elements is X and the product of their images is Y. Now, the fact is that, you know, if there is one, then, then it's true for, then it's true for all of them, but, but, but the condition you can just write is there exists an element there exists a 12 tuple of elements here such that its image is Y. I guess you had, you had to say, which, which is true, that all the elementary subgroups are definable, right? Right, yes. So, so we saw that E13 is definable, but all other elementary subgroups are you obtain them by applying, by conjugating by, by permutation matrix, by fixed permutation matrix. So they are also defined there. Okay, so, so, so let me say this again. The idea was uh, instead of talking about the definability of this map uh, to, to show that So in, in, instead of saying in, in directly that this map is definable, you show it's true the restriction of this map to appropriate subsets is definable. And then you show that enough of them generate a group. You really prove that the map is definable or you prove that the image is, is the No, I prove that the map is definable. A map so the definability of the map means that uh, the graph is definable. So the condition, so, so let's call this map phi. So I want to replace the, this. I want to find the first order statement. So, so let me write this down, okay? I want to find the first order statement that is equivalent to the fact that y equals phi of x. It's equivalent to the following statement. There, there is an element gamma one in uh, the root subgroup E12 up to gamma 12 in, let's say, again, let's suppose we end at E12, okay? Such that the first condition is gamma one times gamma 12 is X and the second condition is the following. If you take the matrix I gamma one conjugated by something times I gamma two times etc. This is equal to y. And so this is a first order statement. And I say that it's equivalent to this, uh, to the condition that, that x is gets sent to y. Because I know that in this, that under this map phi, the element e12, goes to this matrix.
Ahí. Yeah, he's happy. Good. I'm happy. <laughs> Okay, so this, the, the the next idea, what what um, what we really do to bypass the boundary generation is that we use congruent subgroups. We make extensive use of congruent subgroups. So let's take uh, let, let's take now the the case where gamma is a lattice of orthogonal type and of big enough degree, not rank. It should be higher up. Okay. So the first thing we do is we show that the congruent subgroups uh, are definable, but not just definable, are uniformly definable. Uniformly definable means that there is a formula two variables, say, such that uh, if you look, if you plug in parameters, so, so say you look at G, uh, so you look at all solutions to the to, to, to the formula that you get when you plug in G. Gamma. So, so, so a, 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 a formula in two variables, you can think about it as a family of formulas in one variable indexed by the elements of gamma. So the claim is that each one of them is a congruent subgroup. Okay, for every G you plug in, this is a congruent subgroup. And you get all congruent subgroups this way. Okay, that, that's I'm not sure, like, are, are we using Knazer here, or is this just a yes? Okay, this is this is a non-trivial step. And and uh, and the main input is is Knessel. Is Knessel's work on orthogonal groups. But you're not just abstract uh, black box no, inputting no, the congruence. Know. You're actually going into the proof, right? No. So, right. so what Knessel? Okay. So what? So, so maybe I'll say something about it. Uh, just uh, for the others, yeah. Uh, we're now going to talk about a compact quotient, right? Okay. So yes. Yeah, so, so you. The interesting case now is. You have when your lattice is uniform. Okay, Knesser, What Knesser does? Um, I need some space. Okay. So what Knesser does? Knesser takes an element in, 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 in gamma, and what he wants to prove that the subgroup generated, the normal subgroup generated by, by gamma, contains a congruent subgroup, more or less. Okay. So he's unable to do this at first, but his first step is to look not just at, uh, not at all matrices in this subgroup, but only at their first column. Okay, and what Knesser proves that if you look at the first columns of those matrices of elements. Sorry, we in an orthogonal group. So gamma is an orthogonal group, yeah. It's as many variables. And the signature one. is important or not? Yeah, I guess uh, it, it should have rank, it should have S rank bigger than or equal to two. Okay. Uh, and it should be Knesset, I think, wants five uh, the, the degree to be at least five. Okay. Okay. 
So you look at the first column of elements in, so, 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 so you look only at the first column, okay? Now all of these columns, let's say E1 has, uh, has norm one. Okay. So all of these col first columns will have norm one, okay? Uh, what Knessel proves is that given this condition, if you look at all columns of, of, of elements, you get uh, a, a congruence neighborhood of E1 inside this uh, pseudosphere. Okay. So, uh, so first column contain all vectors of norm one that are congruent to E1 mod, mod N. This is not a strong approximation. Is this a, a strong approximation or much more than that? No, much more than that. This is, this is really the crux of, of Meso's work. Yeah. Okay, what, what you need to show, again, what you need to show is that if you have a vector that is congruent close to, to E1, and has the same norm, yeah. then yeah. there is a, 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 an orthogonal transformation that maps E1 to it, okay? It's, it's kind of a weak type of argument, okay? Uh, and what's he, what methods does he use? The, uh, Vick's theorem and... But what's uh, he, if you have, I mean, somehow is it, we don't have bounded generation. We don't have elementary matrices. We just have these uh, elements that we know can't boundedly generate. So, can you say a bit more? But this is uh, and do you get every column in a bounded uh, generated way? Okay. So, so, so we looked at the proof. We had to read it, and <laughs> we 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 showed that actually. You don't need all the whole subgroup. It's enough to take product of let's say twenty conjugates in order to get this uh, uh, um, finite neighborhood. So, so congruence neighborhood of this vector. Okay, so uh, so in fact you can take this twenty depends on the. On yes, gamma, yes, yes. On this gamma. 20 depends on gamma, some constant that depends on gamma. Well, you know, when we proved it, we, we proved it for some constant that depends on gamma. <coughs> My. This is the way we prove it. Okay. Um, to answer Peter's question, um, yeah, I'm just trying to understand the sort of. We know we're going to hear that you can't have bounded generation with the usual sense of with these elements. So I'm trying to understand where you're overcoming it. What what's the much weaker? I mean, okay, I see it's a weaker statement, yes. but having some experience with Pell's equation which would be your biggest enemy. <laughs> I'm trying to understand why if you have uh, these tori, which are much bigger somehow that you can do it. Do you have any intuition? Uh, you know that to make Z, Matusevich's contribute a big input over Davis and um, Robinson was to input Pell's equation right. in order to uh, define Z. I couldn't, that was the final step. So somehow the Pell equation is, is a kind of a decisive thing there. And somehow I believe what you're doing here is you looking at the same thing, but in higher rank. And it's probably a very decisive move. That's why I'm trying to understand it a bit better in uh, By the way, is Knaze the only examples of co-compact congruent subgroup property or the others? Yes, yes. Oh, it, it, this is very much, this is very much uh, related. And, and, and in fact, the only case where we really don't know what to do is, is the case 
you know, that congruent subgroup is not known, namely um, division algebras. Mm -hmm. um, right. so, so, so I don't know. It just seems to me that there's a theme here about uh, this, that tori that's very deep underlying this. Uh, and rank one tori are the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it's just so I message. don't know how to answer this question without actually talking about the proof. I, uh, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, it, it's a geometric argument. You need to show that you can move a vector to another vector. Right, right, right. Okay, and, 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 and again, and I mean, in a way. So somehow, is there some. Yeah, I'm just trying. Uh, yeah, all right. I'll, I'll maybe need to look at the paper. So, no, no, so uh, you quoting him for uh, uh, so you just quote this and then proceed. Is that it? Because you've gone into the proof, you've extracted this. In, in, you're not just no. Uh, there, there is some 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 things to be done. It's really the uh, we add some information if that's the question, but. Uh, but the hard part of the argument is Knesset. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, this, so so where are we now? Okay, we, we, we want to find a, an interpretation of, of, of Z inside my group, okay? Before in SL3Z, we could just define a cyclic subgroup. You know, do half of two thirds of the work. Here, it's not clear how to define, uh, even how to define a cyclic subgroup inside inside my lattice. It is not the centralizer or the center of the centralizer or something. Okay. So what we do is, um, is is proceed in a different way. So first of all, we go to a three dimensional case to uh, to a copy of SO three. It's it's not so important. And now we actually pass to a torus, okay? The centralizer of some semi-simple element there, okay? And the crucial thing is that the finite subsets of delta uh, are definable, in fact, uniform. Okay? And, oh. So that's that again. Inside delta or inside gamma? Does it does that inside delta? No, no, it's important. It, it, we walk inside delta from now on. Okay. L let me just say uh, what's the importance of uniformly. Okay. Uh, now I can quantify, I can say statements, first order statement that would mean for every congruent subgroup, there is something. Okay. So now I'm, I'm going to quantify freely over congruent subgroup or even over primes, congruent, uh, prime congruent subgroups and so on. Okay. And now the second step is to show that the finite subsets of my toes are uniformly definable. Okay, and that's a big step because if you have a structure that, that, that's very, uh, it's a very strong statement that you can quantify over finite subsets of a structure. Okay, and here, here there's a number theoretic uh, input. Okay, and, and uh, let me just say that the, maybe I won't write it just in interest of time. What you want to do in the first step is that you want to find some criterion that defines a big sub, a, a finite subset, okay? Once you have, you, you don't need all subsets, you just need a criterion that will ensure that, that a subset is finite and, you know, to be big enough. Okay, and then you file it, you, you chop it off and, and show that you refine it and show that you can actually define every subset. And, and this, this really goes to, um, I, I won't, I'll just write the, the I'll just write 
ב, ב, what underlies everything is a theorem of Siegel. Okay, and I'll state it for rings. What we need to do is prove an analog of this for, for the stores. Okay, and um, it's Siegel. It's the following theorem. If you have a S integer, a ring of S integers, and you look at the collection of all X, such that the, the norm of X times X minus one is less than C, then this is finite. Of course, this is very closely related to Lang GM. Right, right. No, no. This, this, this. If I wrote it down in terms of, I, I can write it down in terms of a toes. But here we need it for a non-split toes. Okay. If you take this statement and translate it to to, to the toes, you would get what I am not going to write, um, and, and and obtain that you get big enough subsets. Of the tools. And now, once you have, once you know that finite sets, you can quantify all of them. Now you can, for example, define, uh, you can define cyclic subgroups. Okay? So let me tell you, fix your alpha zero. Let me tell you when is it true that. By the way, here this was the rank one situation. Um, if you're in higher rank, do you need Schmidt or do you always only need Ziegel? Can you always? So we didn't bother because we didn't bother thinking about it. Uh, there's probably a theorem here, but, uh, ah, but, the, but the two dimensional, the one dimensional case was enough. Oh, it was enough. Okay. Uh, we didn't want to think about all types of toy that, that okay. might arise. Uh, I'm just asking if it was enough, and you say yes. This is enough. Uh, <laughs> the, the toes, probably, you know, probably the, the claim for higher dimensional toy is also true. So let me tell you when does an element belong to the cyclic subgroup generated by X. This happens if and only if there is a finite set. That contains one. Um, two if Y belongs to, to S. Then and, and, and Y is not equal to X then y times alpha zero belongs to this. Now, if x is, if x is alpha zero to the 100, you can take the set S to be one alpha zero up to alpha zero to the 100. If x is not a power of alpha zero, then you would, then, then this S necessarily is infinite, and therefore, you know, we are quantifying all the finite sets. Okay, so this is this is the first step: how you get, you know, the set that interprets. So I fix my I, I fix some alpha zero, and this is a set which is in natural bijection with a Z. Okay, and now I need to show you that addition. I have, I have a very funny question for you here. Yeah, since you are doing logic. <laughs> Uh, and you are inputting a potentially ineffective theorem. It's mm -hmm. possible that you have a theorem here that this is, you can define this, this is definable, but there's no procedure to define, and no procedure to define it. You realize it. What do you mean? I mean, you need to show us that's finite. You're using Ziegel. Yes. And suppose I actually wanted a computer to do this. To this what? Is, to write down the formula? Yeah. Or to verify that need, it's true. Now you would need some finite number of conditions that this theorem says ensures that you've defined it with a finite number of it. You would probably need the coordinates of the solutions. You're saying the set of solutions to that equation is finite, right? Mm -hmm. I'm saying the proof of that, well, in this specific case may be effective, I don't know, but mm -hmm. typically these proofs are ineffective. You can't write down the solutions. 
okay. in principle. In principle. So I'm just saying, isn't that a bit? Does that enter to? It, might that mean that if? I'm just saying, it is a question that, given where you the kind of mathematics you're thinking about, yeah, you would think it's relevant. The issue of effectivity, which has not entered into anything before. You are using a very deep theory. So, so yes. Um, so imagine you say the, the statement don't the care. Finite, the statement the final set, even if I put a gun to your head. No, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I'm saying so it the, might be that the proof that I'm giving is not effective. <laughs> effective. But the but the, the statements, statements but the statements that I write are effective. So uh, uh, the length of the formula that at the end will define you S O nine of Z is effective. Okay. Now, but when you're reducing one problem to another, which you are, mm -hmm. and I have a computer that's trying to reduce this to this. Imagine there's an ineffective statement in the reduction. I understand. Uh, a, a, computer will have, a computer will have a problem of proving that my theorem is correct, that this is equivalent. But, mm -hmm. uh, no, no, but, the, but, theory, the statement's true. There's no question. No, not just true, but the statement is finite. Is, 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 right. uh, the length of the statement is finite. Yeah, yeah. Now, the length is controlled. I agree completely. Okay. Uh, then, yeah, you're right. Okay, so I told you how to interpret uh, Z inside gamma. Let me just say to answer a question, uh, what do we replace the boundary generation by? Okay, and we use boundary generation in, for SO3 to show that the mutual interpretation, these two interpretations are actually by interpretations. And what we did is we found a definable, uh, to definable onto map right from the same set to gamma and to its interpretation and then once you have such a thing this map the, the, the lower arrow is definable okay now here we don't have it okay we don't have boundary generation but what we do have is that every finite quotient is bounded, or, or every, let's say, congruence quotient is boundedly generated. So suppose I have two elements, x here and y here. It is not true that x is obtained as a, in the image of, uh, of the product of my uh, conjugates of my cyclic subgroup, but, for every prime, for every prime, it is so. So these two maps are on. Now, if I want to say whether, let's call this phi, okay? Once you have phi, you have a map also here. And I say that uh, y is equal to phi of x, if and only if phi of phi y modulo p is phi of p of x modulo p, Okay, but this I can check because I have this, because I have, it, it's, this I can check, so this is for every P. This I can check, this is a first order statement. Because uh, the congruence quotients have boundary generation. Okay, and uh, I have overstepped my, my time here. So thank you very much.
but somehow it doesn't bother you that these are infinitely many conditions. Yeah. Infinitely many no, P. because I can quantify over all primes. The whole point of showing that uh, that that the congruent subgroups are uniformly definable oh, yeah. would be to say that for every parameter g, something happens. Hmm. That's good. Okay, we are a little bit over time, but you are fine because you started it your time. Are there some more questions? Maybe some people from a distance want to ask something? Uh, I had a silly question. Uh, is there an example of a, of a finitely generated group that is has interpretations into Z and vice versa, but it's not bi interpretable? Like, so something with, without bounded generation? Yes. Um, uh, uh, I think the Heisenberg group. Yes. Ah, I see. So this has interpretations both ways, but the the when you compose them, that is not definable within the Heisenberg group itself. I see. Okay. Uh, this simple example. Uh, so not 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 with groups, but if you look at uh, if you look at this ring, okay, it is in mutual interpretation with Z, mm -hmm. but it is not in, in a by interpretation with Z. So mutual interpretation, uh -huh. I will let you, okay, how do you, so, so it's clear that Z interprets. Mm -hmm. Sure, the many ways of like that. Yeah. Uh, the other direction is mm -hmm. the copy of Z that I construct is zero times one times this ring. Mm -hmm. okay, that's, that's clearly a copy of Z. Um, but this interpretation is not a mutual interpretation. If it were a mutual interpretation, then every definable subset every recursively enumerable subset of, of R would be definable because it's true for Z. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you pull back this information, the diagonal the diagonal is a recursively enumerable subset. It's the you start with one one and look at all powers. But right, it's a small exercise to see that it is not uh, definable mm -hmm. inside up. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Neil. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you really for doing it slowly so that we can learn something. I learned actually from you quite a lot today. Next week, we will have uh, Andre Rebinchuk, who will speak from Virginia. And the week after, uh, Jimbo Ren talk from you. Thank you. See you all. Okay.